My name is Nick Tolina. This is Scott Goodwin. We're from OCD Tech, which is the IT Audit and Security Division of O'Connor & Drew. Uh, we're a regional accounting firm. We're going to talk about paste bin scraping uh, and the implications for everyone in this room and everyone in the greater world. I'll let Scott kick it off. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. So we're going to, yeah, we're going to be talking about a web scraping platform that we've designed at OCD Tech to monitor and collect data re related to uh, information leaks and security breaches uh, that have been posted to public sources like Pastebin and other paste uh, websites. Uh, so we'll start with an, just an intro to open source intelligence and some of the, the sources that we're using, uh, the tools that we've used up to this point uh, to collect some of that information, and then why we decided to build our own to collect um, a subset of information that's kind of poorly captured by those tools. Um, we'll talk about uh, where that data is ending up um, for some smaller and even the large breaches, where that data is ending up on the internet and how we can leverage that to capture that information. Um, take a look at the scraping platform itself, how it's built, um, how we're using it, and uh, finally we'll look at some examples of the data that we've captured over the past year or so. Uh, we've been scraping Pastebin and other Pastebin style sites for about a year. So we have um, a pretty big data set to play with. Um, so to start, open source intelligence, that's an umbrella term. Uh, we give to the tools that we use to collect the data as well as the data that comes back. Um, I want to, for people who aren't familiar, I want to distinguish open source intelligence from the open source that you hear uh, with regards to software where you have access to that, uh, the source code itself. In this case, it really means that that data is being collected from the public domain uh, from sources that everybody in the room has access to. So. Um, <clears throat> In the context of security research and um, our team, we're collecting data about a business, uh, sometimes more granularly collecting information about the employees of that business, trying to get an idea for the organizational structure um, while we're planning a security assessment or a pen test. Um, and then also, obviously, we're, we're collecting information about the technical infrastructure um, using DNS to get host names and IP addresses, and then who is, you can connect some of those names that you got in the last step uh, to the DNS records, who owns those websites and then any internet-facing systems that we have. Um, so your firewalls and routers and uh, load balancers and anything that sits inside your DMZ. Uh, so we'll be you know, pinging and probing those systems, trying to get as much information as possible. Um, and we use a number of tools. Uh, so most of you are probably familiar with tools like Recon NG and uh, the Harvester, uh, Discover Scripts. And they're really great for a point-in-time assessment to bring in as much information uh, for whatever sources they're using for those tools uh, you can get a point-in-time assessment of the information that's available on, on the internet. Um, and what we found is what you get back is some personnel information. You can generate employee lists and uh, email address lists and stuff like that. Um, but what you get back is mostly technical data. You, you can get back a lot of information um, to start assembling a picture of their, uh, from the outside of what their network looks like. Uh, but the problem is most of that data is known to be public already. Um, sometimes you'll find you know, the Easter egg of something that uh, somebody didn't know was made public. Um, and one thing that we've tried to use these tools for um, and realize that they don't work very well in this capacity is to identify new data that's been released uh, for a target. So if something new is released uh, and you compare that back to the data that you had before, you could identify that some new information had uh, been made public. And they don't work in that capacity. That's not what they're designed to do. Uh, so what we designed was a tool um, to capture a subset of data on the internet that's really not um, well analyzed by those types of tools and what we're really going after is we want to get right to the password we want to capture any information uh, we want to capture email address and password together um, and that information is out there and it's not something that you can reliably pull back with existing tools so uh, in order to do that we're leveraging um, paste style websites um, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with something like pastebin um, they get their name from your ability to copy any text that you want and paste it to the website. Um, and once you click submit, you're granted a URL uh, dedicated to that text. So you don't have to register a domain name. You don't have to sign up with Pastebin or any of these other sites, really. Uh, some of them you do. But Pastebin allows anonymous uh, pastes. And because of the anonymous aspect of it, they're being uh, abused by hackers and attackers to release that information to the public in cases where they're either trying to make that data for sale, um, make that data available on the dark web so they'll give you a link to where you can go buy it, or um, releasing that data just to either take credit for the, for the breach that uh, they committed or to increase the damages to that target organization. So lots of data is getting posted to Pastebin and, um, and, other, and other sites as well, actually. And I want to 
be clear that that's not what they're designed for, obviously. They were designed ori originally for code sharing and collaboration um, for developers on opposite sides of the planet who want to uh, share code for debugging and peer review without having to use an extra layer like email or FTP. Um, so there's an awful lot of legitimate traffic on these websites as well, and that's why they're still available. Um, but what we're trying to do is uh, grab all that illicit um, material that's being posted there as well. So that's what we've done. We've, uh, we're programmatically extracting data from Pastebin and other websites to pull down um, everything that's there and then uh, secondarily go through that information and try to understand, uh, you know, pull out the information that we're interested in, which is obviously not the majority of the, uh, the traffic that you see. Um, from a web scraping perspective, you're limited by the, the sources that you can scrape. So you have to have access to that site and um, a lot of websites, like you can get an awful lot of information by parsing social media and stuff like that. But once uh, you need, there's an authenticator there, you need to have a username and password. And once you've authenticated, you still only have access to your network. You, can, you can't see everything that's actually there. Um, and <coughs> hackers wouldn't use that forum to release information publicly anyways. Uh, their intent is to get as many eyes on that data as possible. Um, so Pastebin style sites, uh, GIST and Slexi and Pastebin, um, they really, they fit the bill for this type of um, information leakage. And you're also limited uh, to a certain extent by, you know, acceptable use um, when you're program programming um, t requests, when you're programmatically making requests over the internet, it's really easy to not tune the scraper and um, send way too many requests, more than would ever be necessary to that uh, resource on the internet. And if that happens, in most cases, they'll just shut you off uh, or throttle a connection. So you have to be careful. It comes down to tuning um, to get everything that you do need without making extra requests. The tool that we've built is built on a standard LAMP stack. So we have a, a dedicated Ubuntu uh, VM, Apache web server on the front end for, with PHP MyAdmin, which we don't generally use that often, but uh, we have it. MySQL database in the back end, and the entire platform is written in Python. Um, the actual analysis is happening in Python. So we'll go through how it works just really quickly. Um, this is for Pastebin, but it applies to any paste style website. Um, that publishes this archive page. So we first will, step one is to reach out to the, to the URL pastebin.com slash archive. And by parsing the raw HTML content on that page, you can extract um, links to all of the recently created pastes. So it says the posted time over there was zero seconds ago. Um, so this is a constantly updated list of pastes that have been created. So that's step one, create the list of pastes that you're interested in uh, scraping. And then, um, separately, we'll take that list and go through each one of them, uh, reach out to Pastebin at that URL, and pull down that raw text as long as we haven't seen it already. Um, so now we have a paste locally on our VM uh, in memory that came from Pastebin. At that point, what we did originally was take the paste and put it right into the database. Uh, that was like the proof of concept stage. We didn't uh, perform any analysis on it. And then as the data set grew, and the data set grows very quickly, um, it became harder and harder to use that data for anything. Um, any pa an individual paste can have a thousand lines or more, thousands of lines, and we have millions of pastes. So by uh, not performing any analysis on the front end, we were relegated to full text searches only, um, which became incredibly exhaustive from a time and resource perspective. So what we do now, um, kind of like version two, is uh, while we have that paste in memory, we extract information types that we think we're interested in now. Um, so one example that we have up here is uh, an email and password combination. So we have an MIT.edu password, I mean an uh, email address with a colon followed by a string, um, and that string represents uh, a password hash. Um, so we're using regular expressions to match um, uh, username and password combinations that are separated by a delimiter, usually a colon <laughs> or the pipe character, and we have other ones set up for other types of information as well. So now we extract that information and we store it in a separate table in the database, um, which is indexed, so we can get to that data. We have a lot more visibility into the data now because the data set is growing so quickly. At this point, uh, these are rough numbers. It's changing all the time. It's running as we speak. Um, we have 8 million or so pastes over the last year with some downtime in there, so it hasn't been a complete year. 4.5 million email addresses uh, that we've pulled out of these pastes. So if I was a spammer, um, you know, we can stop right here. We have a we have a tool that's generating email addresses uh, in real time. 
And then crucially though, one and a half million about of those email, uh, emails had a password associated with them in the standard format that we see, which is email followed by a colon or a pipe character and then the password. Uh, we're also extracting IP addresses um, and finally onion links. Um, and I'm sure most of you are aware that those are links to the dark, the dark web uh, for lack of a better term. And we collect those because um, it's hard to find resources on the dark web if you don't already have the URL. So we're, scrape, uh, we're collecting those onion links now and in the future, since there's such a wealth of information available on the dark web, uh, the future state will be that those onion links are actually populating their own scraper. So at this point, I want to make clear what we're going to be showing you and uh, why we're interested in this data. And it's because um, there is a tendency for users to uh, do two things. One of them is reuse their corporate or business uh, email address on external services, which is something that has to happen sometimes. Um, it's not necessarily something we, uh, you know, you frown upon using the email address on an external service. Uh, some, sometimes it's frowned upon, but also um, the reuse of passwords across multiple services. So we're targeting um, corporate or business credentials that have been released to Pastebin and other websites as a result of a breach that happened on someone else's server. Um, so when we have you know, a breach of some random website on the internet, um, that data doesn't necessarily have a lot of value. You know, it's not like a Dropbox or a Yahoo breach where it's millions and millions of records. It affects a smaller user base and they not, can't necessarily make um, any real money off of that data. Um, so they post it to Pastebin to make it public and take credit for what they've done. Um, but in that data, there is regularly uh, corporate email addresses for agencies and businesses uh, of all types. And when there's a password associated with that email address, uh, there's always a chance that that's a valid password for the, uh, for the organization itself. So that's what we're targeting and that's what we're gonna be showing you um, later on with the examples. So how do we use this data internally? Uh, well, obviously we, we like to go through the data for, from a research perspective. Um, that's what I spend a lot of time doing, trying to see what's been released. Um, but also for vulnerability assessments and pen tests, this is you know, one of our first stops. We, um, we have a year's worth of pastebin data and ideally we would be entering uh, these environments already having credentials to the, um, you know, to the environment. They don't have to be admin credentials or anything like that, but we can hopefully we'll be starting an engagement um, already having some credentials to that environment. Um, but so besides those two things, what we were trying to do at the very beginning was come up with a way to create alerts based on um, our own information being released to Pastebin, clients, partners, or vendors, uh, that whole supply chain. So if any of that information makes its way to Pastebin, um, we want to create an alert on that. And initially we had sent those via email, just like every other service, um, and people stopped looking at them, as is to be expected. So now what we're doing is sending them directly to Slack, so, uh, which is a chat program. Um, they have laptop and mobile clients. So we're getting these uh, alerts right to our cell phone. And we've also set up uh, the ability to search through that database via Slack. So we have uh, pretty much, the database is more or less uh, pretty well integrated from a mobile device standpoint. You don't need to have VPN access or you don't need to putty, none of that stuff. No MySQL syntax, just um, basic searching can be completed via Slack. So let's take a look at some of the data that we found over the last year. Um, the NASA breach was semi-publicized. Um, you might have heard of that. that. A lot of that information was released to Pastebin. Um, we have FBI credentials. Uh, you see that there's a hash up there and then I, I left the, the IP address uh, unobscured as well because it shows that you know, we're using pattern matching to do this. We're not, we don't know what that piece of data is that's after that delimiter. In this case, it was an IP address and that might not be a password but we can still associate that IP address with the, uh, with the FBI uh, e uh, email address that goes with it. Um, so we're capturing all that information regardless of what the string is. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, and then from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, the United States Department <coughs> of Energy. Um, we've captured credentials for the Federal Reserve Bank over the last year. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, we captured one password that's potentially valid in that environment. And then the FDIC, we also captured a number of emails, no passwords though, and I left that in there because I think that most people would still be interested to understand the context of how their uh, agencies or their businesses email addresses, even the email by itself, is making its way to Pastebin. Um, you know, you don't necessarily, if they're not aware of that information making its way out, then there's a chance that, you know, it came from inside their network. Um, I'm pulled out, I tried to take a uh, breadth over depth approach with these examples, uh, trying to show that large companies are affected by this 
just as a result of the number of users that they have. So there's, the more users that you have, the more email addresses you have in Exchange, the more uh, users are spreading that information out over the internet, and the more opportunities you have for password reuse. So um, United Healthcare, that's the largest healthcare provider in the United States. We have credentials that are potentially valid in that environment. Um, pharmaceutical, McKesson, uh, the same story. From the defense sector, we pulled out Raytheon. Um, got a couple passwords for them. And then in the retail space, we pulled out Walmart. A uh, single password for them as well. Ford, looks like they might have had an actual breach. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, that's a, quite a few uh, passwords. Amazon has a pretty big presence here uh, at Security B side, so we pulled them out for, for e-commerce. Um, and then for communications, we pulled out AT&T. So it really does span all industry sectors, uh, medium to large size businesses. This is more of an eventuality than it is anything else uh, in, in our perspective. I mean, I have trouble, uh, I'm, you're more likely to find it than not find it for large businesses in, in our pastebin database. Since Harvard is nice enough to partner uh, with Security B-Sides this year, uh, I figured it would be a good forum to bring up higher education because we see more .edu uh, credentials on pastebin than any other top level domain. And that's, again, a function of that intuitive trend that you have more users, uh, and in this case, more users who aren't necessarily security focused, spreading that information out. Um, and we, you know, students are probably just as likely as everyone else to be reusing those passwords too. So um, this is not a Harvard University problem um, by any means. These are student credentials. Uh, their, their student body is you know, constantly changing. They're always uh, provisioning new email addresses and revoking old ones. So. Um, you know, we're pretty interested to find out, uh, one, what percentage of these credentials are potentially valid for higher education institutions, not just Harvard, but anybody. And then two, um, you know, what can we get to with those credentials? Not, you know, we're not going out and validating that any of these work, but, you know, is none of these student portals usually uh, have two-factor authentication or anything like that because it's such a burden for the, for the whole environment. So. You know, every, every university has a student portal and they're all available online. So statistically, this is only a subset. I mean, we've had, we have 100 in the last year for Harvard University uh, distinct email and password combinations. So statistically speaking, I think we should be able to get access to some financial records. Um, um, web scraping for fun and profit. So I already talked about the fun part. Um, from the profit perspective, uh, Pastebin is a clearinghouse for um, stolen data. It's an advertising platform for hackers. Uh, you'll, it's, you're constantly finding um, links to purchase this information um, in Bitcoin on external sites, usually on the dark web. But we do see credit card numbers very, very regularly posted to Pastebin um, and, and other uh, paste style websites. And we use regular expressions, again, to, for this pattern matching. And um, what it comes down to is that we see so many um, that it's really highly unlikely that they're all valid credit card numbers, even though they match that pattern. Um, so what we do is we retain the paste ID uh, in this table so we can always uh, refer back to the raw paste so we can get the context of how that credit, con credit card or potential credit card number was released uh, and try to understand if it really represents a credit card number because, you know, these, for instance, these ones down here that have the space right in the middle, um, it's hard to tell. I mean, generally, there's system logs and tons of code and encrypted data and binary data. People post all sorts of things to Pastebin. So uh, we kind of have to take a holistic approach to pulling out these numbers. And if we were interested in finding out if they're real or not, we'd have to go back to that original paste and try to get that context. Um, so we're not really profiting off of this, obviously. We're not using those credit card numbers and we're not trying any of these credentials that we found. Um, for us, it's more about a potential savings so we're going to try to identify those threats as soon as they're made public. Uh, obviously, we have no visibility into what happened with those credentials before they were made public or who else has them uh, prior to that. But as soon as that information is made public, and I assure you that we're not the only people who are doing this, um, once that data is made public, it becomes uh, a risk to that in that environment that someone else is going to try to use those credentials uh, against you. So the faster that we can respond to these types of things and you know, basically change that password if it happened to be a legitimate password, we're going to limit the damages. We're going to limit the ability of an attacker to use public domain data against us. Um, and you know, at the bottom, a pretty common, uh, commonly cited stat is the cost of a data breach. And 
any single one of these credentials could instigate a breach like that, even if they're not you know, domain admin or anything like that. Once you have access to an email inbox or something like that, you can start pivoting and um, gaining trust and you have a foothold in that environment. So for our, for our perspective, it's not about making money as much as it is saving money. Um, questions? Any good reason for why they would do that? Yeah, any good reason for Facebook not to do this? That would impact sir, their ability to provide service to, to customers. So the question is, is there any good reason for them not to do it? Exactly. So like they haven't done it yet. I mean, I think that that, that sounds like a, like one of the possible ways to uh, sort of mitigate this as a potential risk. Because you know, you guys, it's, it's good that you're releasing this to to us, but you know, others may not be. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, Pastebin um, is absolutely aware of this problem. Um, and they are more or less profiting off of it, to be honest with you. So previous to, about halfway through the scraper project, maybe six months ago, um, we were doing raw HTML scraping, parsing the raw HTML content on the page and pulling out the, the, you know, the raw text from the paste. Um, and that's what we still have to do for all other uh, sources that we're scraping. Pastebin released an API for scraping. And um, if, you don't, if you don't use their API, um, they're gonna shut you off immediately. Um, we've had issues with other services, um, throttling, throttling the connection and, and whatnot, but um, uh, the real way that they're mitigating this, and Pastebin's not doing anything to mitigate this, they will remove paste data that's been made public, but it's not before the data is made public. So the data gets posted to that archive page that I showed you immediately, um, and we're scraping all of that. And when we raise an alert, oftentimes by the time the alert makes it to the cell phone and you try to click the link to go look at the paste, the paste has already been removed from Pastebin but the paste is in our pastebin database and it's in everybody else's pastebin database already. Um, so other services and the services that we're not scraping are ones that have either A, an authenticator in front of that page so you have to log in uh, and only see your network of people that you're allowed to talk with really, um, or B, they don't make the list of pastes public so you don't know what you're looking for. Um, they don't make an archive page public so I can create a list of pastes that I want to go out and scrape. I would have to basically guess paste IDs until I found them and that's just not going to work. Um, so the real way that they're mitigating this is by not making public pastes, uh, not making the URL for public pastes public domain. Even though if I navigated to that URL I would still be able to access that. I just don't have that data to start with. Yep. That yep. Um, that's why we keep the original information, uh, the original paste, so we can always reference back. Usually what you find is that they'll either be either a portion of the credit card number or the whole credit card number with no extra information and then a link to go purchase these records on the dark web. Okay. Um, it's not, we tried to create, I, I've tried to create a regular expression that would also parse out the, C, you know, the CCV number and everything else and um, it just broke every time. So. What we have to do is, uh, when we find a credit card, and I'm like, we haven't really started digging into the credit card data yet because there's nothing we can really do with it um, unless one of our credit card data you know, popped up. We could go back and verify whether or not it came out of some random junk data or if it, um, and we do see full credit card, uh, we have absolutely seen full, full records released. And that doesn't mean that they'll work. I mean, it could be shut down or whatever, but they're absolutely uh, full records available too. Sure, and was there another question? Yeah. yeah. I have a short question. Sure. Which is, in general, are you seeing, is, is there a size limit on pace? Are you seeing large dumps, small dumps? Uh, there is a size limit, a max size limit on the pace. I think it's 500 kilobytes. Okay. Uh, people are making, you can make multiple pace um, right in a row. Um, but there is a limit just based on bandwidth, kind of. They, they put a, pace bin puts a limit on how big of a pace that you can create. Um, so I'm going to get out of here. And in order to give a demo. I'm going to search right from Slack. So, you know, we could log into the database and do it that way. Um, but I'm going to pull up our Slack client. Is anyone brave enough to offer a domain that they're associated yeah. with to see whether we've scraped anything? <laughs> what do you got? Uh, Rudder-net.com. Okay. R-U-T-T-E-R. Uh, I will give you a, um, there is a, a disclaimer a that's, uh, as you can see right here, if there was a plain text password associated with that It'll domain, it's yeah. going to show up right here. Okay. okay. You're right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll show you this too. Shell CMD paste bin. We're telling. We're going to tell. 
our, uh, we have a robot set up to do this. Um, we're going to tell the robot that we're going to be executing a, sh a command in bash, which is called pastebin, and that's living on a VM on our network. Um, and then we're going to do, we're searching for a domain, and what was it again? R-U-T-T-E-R dash N-E-T dot com. And I didn't put in a condition that says if there's nothing, say no. So that means nothing. Sweet. So you're clean. You're safe. Um, big, we, you know, it works really well for, for big, uh, big domains. Yep. V-A-N. That'll be a good one, I think. Tell Andrew he's fired. Yeah. That was longer than I thought. So yeah, uh, proof. It does work. Uh, what was? Uh, yeah, we can do Qualcomm, which is two M's, right? Yeah, the bigger the domain, the more likely this is to be um, a, you know, a problem. It's just statistics, really. It's not to say we don't find small businesses that's an issue as well. We certainly do. Um, so now, these are, somebody posted the same thing over and over again, so we got no passwords there, but hang on. These are all from individual pastes. Uh, negative. Well, we have one, but it's, there's no password. Yes, but it's locked down entirely to the, to those words. Okay. You, I can't I can't run whatever I want. I've I, no. Not what I so we don't have. <laughs> <coughs> we this is not an interactive bash shell. No. Okay. This is uh, me calling out to a server that we've set up to um, to run a specific script, and it doesn't accept anything else except for um, there's a number of things that we can do with this robot, but it doesn't accept anything outside of that. So you can't run rm minus rf and. Not yeah. yet. <laughs> Pardon. Absolutely yeah. not. This, I'm not a developer. I hope nobody, nobody touch any of this stuff because I'm sure it's very fragile. <laughs> but proof of concept, it does work. Can we join this What? Can we join it? For a fixed monthly fee. <laughs> <laughs> We're also hiring, so. Just talk to Predator from one of your dumps. <laughs> yep. Are, are you PCI compliant? That's an excellent question. We've, uh, we've been struggling with how, you know, what... Um, what controls really need to be in place for this type of data? Um, it's an excellent question, and everybody has their own opinion. And um, up until now, or a little while ago, it was our answer was that it's public domain data, and we're not the only people that have it. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that it is PII. Uh, we have pretty, I mean, I'm the only one with access to, directly to the database. Obviously, anybody with access to Slack can search the database. Um, but we have access controls, and uh, the virtual disk is encrypted, and that's all we have in place. I mean, I'm scraping data from Pastebin that everyone else has as well, so more nefarious people. Yep? So you're only showing the passwords, but I've noticed you also gather the hashes, too. Um, it's a, what is shown here, if, if one of these had been released with a hash, it would be shown here. Uh, oh, okay. We're not differentiating between a password and a hash. Okay. Um, anything that comes after the delimiter next to a, an email address is what we're calling the password. So sometimes that's a hash if the web application has the passwords. Uh, sometimes it's a plain text password. Um, so we're not differentiating there. Yep. Are you collecting other types of login info, like usernames that aren't necessarily email addresses? We have everything that's been posted to Pastebin in the last year. So uh, <laughs> the reason we keep everything is because we can go back and answer questions like that. We can re-extract whatever data we want by designing a, um, yeah, we're running out of time. Uh, by designing a new regular expression, go back through that entire database, a year's worth of data, 100 gigabytes, extract every piece of information that we're interested in, and store it in its own table. Uh, so we're looking to do that with social security numbers right now. <laughs> What's the ratio to hash passwords to plain text? Uh, we see many more plain text passwords than hash passwords, and really? I believe that's a result of some of those pa uh, plain text passwords being complete bunk. It's hard to say. We don't know if, it, if it's real or not. We're not validating any of this. But when we see a hash password, uh, the people who that belongs to should probably be nervous because it's generally real. Or, you know, it's real for whatever resource was compromised. Oh, so, you know, any other questions? You guys can come up yeah. and I'll search whatever you want. Find it after.